Now you all know I got a couple of bones to pick with, with some of these parables. Mark doesn't do too badly about this. When he talks about the mustard seed growing into, he calls it a big shrub. Uh, Luke, I think especially, and, and, and possibly also Matthew, talks about the mustard tree as this towering thing being so tall, and, and it's just not. Right? A mustard bush doesn't get very tall. It does get wide, right? Um, so when we talk about the mustard seed, uh, put an asterisk there, all right? And I want to put one more asterisk next to this last line where we hear that uh, he explained everything in private to his disciples, because did he, though? Just about ten verses before this, we get Jesus telling the parable of the sower and the seed. Remember that one and the four different kinds of soil? And the sower is just throwing seed all willy-nilly, and it lands all different kinds of places. And he says, that's what the kingdom of God is like. And then everybody looks at him like, huh? And so he goes with his disciples into a back room somewhere, and they... And they said, what on earth are you talking about? We asked you about the kingdom of God. You're talking about somebody throwing seeds all over the place who ought to be fired, by the way, because it doesn't look like he's actually planting them. He's just throwing them on the pathway and stuff. And you're talking about soil. And what does it got to do with the kingdom? And Jesus sits there and explains every point by point and says, don't you get this? Come on, keep up. He explained everything in private to his disciples. I think he tried to explain everything in private to his disciples, but it's pretty clear they didn't get it. And so that last line, by, by most scholarship, is considered to be a gloss, something that might have been added later to, to, to assuage some fears that maybe something in the scripture was not so easy to understand and simply couldn't be understood, right? Someone wrote in there, and then, and then he explained everything to his friends. Don't know who that could have been. Early church uh, bishop, maybe a copyist at some point. I, I kind of like to think uh, it was Peter. Somebody's reading the Gospel of Mark to Peter. This is the first gospel to come out, right? It's circuit certain to make its make its rounds around. And Peter hears somebody read, and then he tried to explain everything to his disciples, and they didn't get it. Peter's going, "Oh no, 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 no. We he told us all about it in the back room later. I know about it. All of us know about it." Oh, cool, so you can tell us what he meant. Oh, no, no, you got to figure it out yourself. <laughs> sure, Peter. All right. The point is that even the disciples, even the 12 people closest to Jesus, didn't get his parables right away. Parables have this mystery to them, right? That word comes from the same word, parabola, right? It's, it's uh, to be thrown alongside, and so it's a metaphor, not to explain what something is, in this case the kingdom of God, but to explain what it's like. It's a challenge that has been faced by theologians, mystics, poets, and romantics since time immemorial. We're trying to put something into words that defies reason and language. And so we have to approach it in terms of metaphor. As a result, parables don't have simple, easy-to-digest explanations or definitions, right? Making them just as rich to preach from as they are dangerous to preach from, right? When we try to process a parable as an allegory where every symbol expresses one particular idea. We can find ourselves coming to all too easy, all, all too falsely clear-cut answers, and we find ourselves falling into legalism. Someone tells us, oh, this is what that parable means, and we say, well, that must be the one and only interpretation. When in truth, a parable is a lot more like looking into a multifaceted diamond or gem. It looks a little different no matter which uh, perspective you take on it, the different angles of your observation, you can see different shapes in it. That's the beauty of the parables and also their frustration. To make matters worse, who's telling this parable? Jesus. Whose own life is a parable of God. Right? 
who's, who, who didn't come around uh, preaching and teaching theology, who didn't come around giving easy answers, but by living and doing and being and causing folks to look at him and observe and try to figure out who God is through learning who he is. That complicates things. And so when we talk about parables in this sort of logical context, it's a lot like doing a literary study of a poem or doing art history or music theory. We can get at best a theoretical understanding, and that doesn't hurt, but we're not going to be able to fully appreciate the depth of what is being conveyed until we've wrestled with it and until we've lived it. And in this case, in terms of the parable of God that is Jesus of Nazareth and the gospel, the good news of his life and teaching, the only way to get it is intentional, intense self-giving over to Jesus. All the scripture is open to interpretation, and parables may be especially so. It's far from straightforward. It's complex. It's heavy. It gets messy. And so let this serve as my caveat, that what we're going to get into today is only one interpretation of a very interpretable passage. And if you disagree, that's fine. If you want to say something, that's on you. <laughs> On one hand, we want to approach a parable like an allegory and really dissect it and define it. On the other hand, a parable functions quite a bit like the koans of the Zen masters of Buddhism. If you're unfamiliar with a koan, a koan is a little saying. It's not quite a riddle. It's not quite a statement. It's often a question. Uh, one of the most famous ones is, uh, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Right? And if you've ever posed that question to somebody who can do that thing with their wrist and clap with one hand, it's very frustrating. And I think that that person probably would have done very poorly in a Zen monastery, but I digress. The point is, a koan is often given by a Zen master to a pupil for that pupil to wrestle with for years, sometimes their entire life. One of my favorites is, show me your true face, the one you had before your parents were born. And we want to give an answer. We want to figure out, what does that question even mean? We want to logic our way into it, but that's not the point. Like a parable, the point isn't to define it and to dissect it. The point is to wrestle with it. The practice of wrestling is the point. It gets us out of our discriminating, critical, logical mind and engages a deeper part of us that is contemplative and comfortable with just a little bit of mystery. Because a koan like a parable defies definition. Any answer we can come up with is going to fall short. In the words of one of America's favorite, favorite preachers, Fred Craddock, because the subject matter is the mystery of the kingdom, the listener should expect snatches of insight and partial discoveries rather than mastery of the subject matter. And so we've been told we shouldn't allegorize parables when we've seen Jesus allegorize one ten verses back. And so we've learned that we, we're supposed to wrestle with parables as koans and we shouldn't allegorize them, but we're going to. So against our better impulses, and because Jesus did it first, so it's okay, let's allegorize this parable a little bit. Let's get poetic and take a deep dive into some of the symbols of these parables and see what we come back up with. It might just be a glimpse of the kingdom. Now, I didn't read it, but right before this, as I mentioned, is the parable of the sower and the different soils. It's the first of a set of three parables which all focus on the kingdom of God and which focus on the metaphor of the seed. And it's worth bringing in here because they all kind of play very nicely together. Right? The sower sows the seed. We're told the seed is the word, and we expect the sower to be Jesus, right? Because we're allegorizing a parable like we're not supposed to do. Anyone who sows the word, well, that can also be the evangelizing disciple. 
And I mean here, of course, evangelizing in the true sense of the word, not, not with the express purpose of conversion, but simply to proclaim the good news. So anyone who spreads the word is the sower. And the seed, the word. Now here we get little w word implying scripture. But what if the seed, which is sown, could also be the word with a big W? You know, Christ. What if the things that we sow aren't just scripture quotes? But what if the seeds we sow are the little acts, the little words and gestures that we share with our fellow human beings every day? Not so much the things that we say, but the things that we show. If the seed is to be the word with a capital W, if the seed is to be a little glimpse of Christ, an experience of radical love, of forgiveness, mercy, and peace, then those seeds are the little moments to which we contribute simply by being present in the truest sense of the word. They're the opportunities that we take to embody the gospel, to live our faith. They're the intersection of who, what, where, when, and how at any given moment. And we're a part of, but can't claim all for ourselves. They're these little points of light, these little seeds, these moments of truth and beauty and grace that we sow all day long. And eventually those seeds get planted. The sower sows his seeds, we're told, and they blend all kinds of different places, but eventually one of those seeds finds good soil. And here I like to think we become the seed. I told you we were abusing metaphors today. All rules are off. Okay? Because it was at least one such point of light and of grace in whatever particular form it took, whether that was our baptism as children, whether that was a friend bringing us to church, or any number of other people, places, or events which led us each here this morning. It was a seed that started each of us on our faith journey. And once that seed is planted, we're each faced with an ancient question. Will we germinate? Will we sprout and grow? Or will we lie dormant in the earth just to be swallowed up by the dirt? We can choose to stay buried, right? That's that self-serving life, that worldly life that says, well, I'm here. Uh, okay. But we can also choose that eternal life, that God and neighbor serving life. We can choose to answer God's call to the discipled life and by so doing sprout and grow and overcome that apparent death under the dirt. The Apostle Paul says to his first letter to the church at Corinth that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And that's fair. That's true. Jesus lost a lot of followers after the crucifixion. Right? After all, what kind of Messiah, what kind of God worth worshiping would show up just to die? We, our natural inclination is to want a God of immediate results not revelatory self-sacrifice, right? We want a God who will take all the stuff about us that we like and make it bigger. We want a God who will let us keep all of our stuff and our time and our pride and our hatred and still send us to a gold-plated mansion after we die for some reason. But the God we know in Christ ain't like that. Paul follows up that line. He says, but to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. That our temptation when we're planted as seeds is to identify too strongly with the seed, with the stuff 
that we come into this life with. Those seeds, those moments, those situations, what we could even call those blessings which come to us, we can and do all too easily define ourselves by that stuff. The circumstances of our birth, the stuff, the things we've collected, the titles that we've attained. We can say, this is me. I'm from this place and my family is these people and I work this job. That's who I am. The mystery in the growing of the seed is that it's only when we acknowledge with both head and heart that we are more than simply a collection of circumstances that we can truly begin to live and to grow. When we overcome all of our stuff, when we say I'm more than my stuff, and in fact I am a fearfully and wonderfully made child of God, imperfect but beloved nonetheless, And once we really get over ourselves, then we can admit that we are fearfully and wonderfully made imperfect and beloved children of God, just like everyone else. It's only after we get there, only after we recognize that we are not the end of our universe and that we're not alone, when we realize that we are part of an interconnected whole, it's at that time that we, through the nurture of God and Holy Spirit, overcome the shell of our seeds and start reaching out into the earth, sending roots into the bottomless wellspring of Christ. One of the challenges that Jesus had in his ministry were folks who believed that their lineage qualify them for some form of salvation. Say, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm a chosen person. That's an awful lot like a seed of wheat sitting in the ground saying, I'm wheat, and never sprouting or growing. Unless it sprouts and grows, it will never become anything that can be harvested. Jesus sends a definite message to all those who want to lean back on their lineage to qualify them for harvest but he sends that same message to all of us who think that a nominal Christianity or a culture of churchianity will excuse us from the emotional social and spiritual work of discipleship and that means transformation Here we have this wonderful expression of mystery. The farmer doesn't know how the seed becomes a stalk of wheat. It just happens. That secret is between the earth, the seed, and God. And that mystery, that transformation, is the same thing that happens to us in our faith journey. By the way, still a mystery. Even with ion microscopes, we can see how the seed turns into wheat. We still don't know why it does it how it knows, and why certain seeds don't sprout when some do. Right? It's a mystery. It's a change. It's a transformation. And we need to be ready for it. And we, not, we need to not let it scare us when it happens. Because God is not going to leave us like God found us. And that's a good thing. Then we move on to the stalk of wheat. And we see the end stages of our faith transformation. When all of a sudden all the other seeds in the ground look up at you and go, you've changed, man. And we say, well, thank you. It's called growth. You should try it. We ought not be nervous when we find ourselves and our beliefs changing and growing and evolving. And one of the big reasons we ought not be nervous is because we're not doing it alone. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us on that journey individually, but also through our church family. We ought not be afraid to talk about these things with each other either. And on the flip side, we ought to be ready to nurture one another. One of the neat things about the parallel of uh, the, uh, the metaphor of wheat. Wheat doesn't grow for itself. Nobody grows wheat for decoration. 
Nobody's growing a hedge of wheat to really you know, fill out their, their landscaping. It is a life-sustaining grain. And so its purpose, its use, doesn't end when it's cut down. And in fact, it really goes on to serve its purpose when it is cut down to nourish further life. The stalk of wheat reminds us that we are not called as human beings and especially as Christians. We're not called just to get tossed around and get buried. We are called to grow and beyond that to flourish, to become something new, something beautiful, something steeped in grace and glory. A sacred stalk of wheat. And even better than that, as we see, once the head is formed, then we get grains in the head. Wheat spreads its own seeds by the virtue of its own flourishing. Thus the kingdom of God grows. As each one of us grows and flourishes, so more seeds, more grace is sown out into the field. The plant actually becomes the sower, which just complicates things more. Let's not go there. But in the process of transformation from seed to stalk of wheat to further seeds carried on the breeze, we see an invitation to take part in the new creation that Paul spoke of in his letter to the church at Corinth. That means, among other things, that we are not bound by who we have been. In the new creation, we are no longer bound by who we have been, the things we have done, the attitudes we have assumed. This is a random story. At one time, I was given the opportunity to drive a supercar around a racetrack a few times. My wife gave me um, a coupon for Christmas, and it was one of the coolest things I've ever done. But three laps in this car with a professional in the seat right next to me giving me instructions. Right? I've never done any race driving in my life. I'm a total amateur out there. Right? So the first lap is to get used to the track and to see all the marks you need to hit to make the racing turns and all that kind of good stuff. The second lap is kind of to get up to speed. And the third lap is to kind of take a quick, quick lap, as quick as you can, right? Second lap, I'm driving this Audi R8 for any of you who care about this kind of stuff, right? Um, around this corner. And I totally, I, I just really messed up a turn. And it was one of these S curves, you know? So I... I mess up the first turn and it's going to cost me time and I just, I, I, I vocalize. I said, oh, I really messed that up. You know what the guy next to me said? That's back there, man. I'm looking at a new turn right ahead of me and I can't stop thinking about the one I just messed up. I'm using valuable time worried about something I screwed up back there that is gone. Are you, when, when Paul writes in his letter about the armor of God. You know that helmet of salvation imagery that we hear about? You ever tried looking backwards in a helmet? <laughs> Something to think about. We're not invited to look backwards. We're invited to become new. And that phrase, new creation, in Greek it's kinekatesis, right? Uh, some, some translations call it a new creature, right? If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. And some new creation, or part of the new creation. I love, actually, the Greek grammar on this one. It reads a lot more like, if anyone in Christ, a new creation. It's an exclamation. It's an explosion. It's not focused on me, because if I've got any of the gospel spirit in me, why am I focused on me, right? It's not me being a new creature. It's not me being a part of a new creation. It is everything is made new. It is a whole new creation. And that includes us, but it doesn't center on us. It centers on Christ. We are invited to become a part of a new creation, which is more than just a slightly changed world. It is a whole new mode of existence. Seen through the lens of the cross, which is foolishness to those who, is, who are perishing, 
but it is nothing short of the power of God to us, right? We see with fresh eyes. We look around us and we see that everything is connected to God. We can't, we can't not see it ever again, right? And there's some conflict here. With these fresh eyes, with these Easter eyes, with the eye of our heart wide open, we see what God wants us to see. And it is at odds with everything else that we see with our human eyes. Right? And that's why Paul tells us we have to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, commenter Charles Cousar says, The prospect of God's rule of earth may not appear reassuring. The newspapers in the Roman Empire hardly carried banner headlines trumpeting the success of Christianity, its overthrow of slavery, or its winning converts in high places. The promise, nevertheless, is there. Inconspicuous beginnings will lead to a vast conclusion. And here I'm thinking about mustard seeds. God's rule will not be thwarted. Part of our journey of transformation in faith, part of the sprouting moment that gets us out of our earthly premature grave is actual faith. Not belief, not writing Christian on the line on the census. Faith as in radical trust. Faith that things are actually going to work out well. Can you think of a harder thing to do, a more countercultural thing to do, than to actually trust that things are going to work out okay? Especially after this last year, it's hard. Now, that might not be today. It might not be this month. It might not be this lifetime. Again, Kusar continues. He says, it's critical to observe that this promise does not have to do with the immediate success of the church, membership, budgets, or so on, or with the prosperity of individual believers, but with the ultimate triumph of the reign of God. Friends, our journey of growth in growing as wheat in God's field, means pushing ever upwards toward the sun in our flourishing. Knowing that we may not and probably will not reach it, but knowing that our purpose is fulfilled in our striving for it. We're called to believe, just as Dr. King did, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. To believe that humanity, despite our horrible track record, could actually be redeemable through the one whose image we all share. To believe that God's will will win, that the kingdom will come, and that we can help make that happen simply by living into our faith and being in the world. Helping to create those little seeds. Those little moments of grace and of truth. Let's talk about the farmer. It's a little sad. We don't hear a whole lot about the farmer and his activity in this story. Other than uh, his going to sleep and his getting out of bed. We know that he's not idle. Right? He's ready to head out as soon as the harvest is ripe. He's got a sickle in his hand. He's not lazy. He's not dropping the ball. We just don't hear a whole lot about him and what he's doing. And ultimately, it's a reminder that the growth of the wheat in the fields is up to the seed and to the earth and ultimately to God. The farmer can't really do anything to coax the seed or the, the wheat out of its seed. Right? Again, to quote Kusar, the farmer represents a wholesome reminder that the consummation of God's reign is not dependent on our best activity. We're freed from the burden of determining the harvest, of assuming that our successes or failures hasten or deter God's plans. What a liberating thought. The fortunes of the kingdom do not rise or fall with programs that succeed or fail. 
The basis for optimism about the future rests in God, the giver of growth and the sole determiner of the time for harvest. The farmer and his, his, the lack of mention of his activity reminds us that all we can do is sow seeds. And that quite frankly, the more we mess with those little moments of grace, the more we try to put our little human designs and plans into them, the more likely we are to ruin it. The farmer might represent God, might represent time, might even represent the church. It's a parable. Everybody could be just about everything. But we know that the farmer is the bringer of the harvest. And we ought to talk about the harvest. Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark doesn't cast this in a terribly eschatological sense, which is to say his is not necessarily focused on the end of the world. It's not, uh, it's not too, too focused on judgment. And if it is judgment, it's judgment that ought not be feared, but awaited lovingly. The farmer's harvest is not a judgment, but a coming of fruition. There's nothing negative happening here. If I may be so bold, we don't hear about the farmer throwing all the less than perfect grain into the fire. We don't hear about the farmer digging up every seed that didn't sprout just to spank it for not sprouting. This isn't that kind of judgment. This is simply a reminder that that which we do for the kingdom, that which we do in Christ as part of the new creation, doesn't stop when we do. That it goes on. And if we really want to abuse this metaphor, it gets baked into the bread, which is the body of Christ. But we're not going to go there right now. Once the time comes for our harvest, if we've given ourselves fully, to following Jesus. And if we have fully flourished, we may be cut down, and we will be cut down. But the fruits of our labors in this life will go on to nourish more life. And that's part of the promise of the kingdom. All we can do is do our best to help make those seeds to be ready to be agents of grace and to send them out into the world. Here's your friendly reminder that the kingdom of God isn't a place. It's not a territory to be conquered and held. It's a state of mind and really a mode of being. We hear kingdom and we instantly think of castles and walls and political intrigue and warfare the word reign is probably more appropriate. The kingdom of God, the kingness of God, the reign of God. The kingdom of God comes whenever we make God king of our lives. Right? It's a good reminder to the world as a whole that the kingdom of God cannot be legislated into being, nor can it be coerced. The kingdom of God must be loved into being. And that love comes in the form of sowing seeds. So what does this kingdom look like? Jesus said it looks like a mustard bush. Now anyone listening to this, if they had been attentive at all when learning their Torah, would recognize the, the old comparison by several Old Testament prophets of the kingdom of God to a towering cedar way up into the sky, a towering cedar like those tall cedars of Lebanon. And yet Jesus makes it about a mustard bush. Tall, majestic tree. Weed. Invasive bush with little yellow flowers. It's his nice, subtle literary reminder that the kingdom of God doesn't need to be, and in fact isn't going to be, some grandiose spectacle. But rather is inexorably steeped in the humility of God, which we saw in the Christ who went to the cross. So Jesus picks a bush, a shrub. Uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Schlafer, a, uh, an Episcopal priest, 
says, perhaps this metaphor serves as a further check on strategies for church growth which are consciously or unconsciously charged with the vision of human grandeur. Perhaps the plan of God has to do with purposes unconnected to or at cross purposes with our own. Mustard bushes proliferate in scruffing, scruffy, seemingly disorderly array, and yet they provide resting places for flocks of birds. It can be unsettling when our designated ecclesial places and our carefully created programs produce results which we were not expecting or even wanting. It prompts the question, whose garden is this anyway? A garden of weeds, says Jesus, is what the kingdom looks like. Wind-blown seeds and scruffy underbrush. This is how God's kingdom grows. The weeds which the world has rejected have become the shelter and shade of God's own provision. Now, doesn't that sound like Jesus to y'all? Mm-hmm. Folks, the kingdom doesn't grow through other people calling us Christians. It grows through faithful disciples helping their neighbors know Christ through them. And that only comes from faithful people living for Christ. Not being called Christian, but for being Christian. Every day. The kingdom grows from growing, or it only comes from growing tall as stalks of sacred wheat in the kingdom's fields. Surrounded as we are by a great field of companions flourishing along with us. It comes from availing ourselves to God so that God may produce through us those little seeds, those tiny pieces of Christ-likeness, the same which set us on this path and have sustained us all along, and which carry in them the DNA of the kingdom of God, so that we may prove to be faithful and fruitful by the time our harvest comes. Here's some good news. We serve the one whose kingdom, whose new creation, is not something in the far-off future. That means it's not something we can count on to bail us out later. We serve one whose kingdom is happening right here and now. And it's not something that happens just once and for all. It's something which continually happens inside ourselves and all around us. The kingdom of God, the new creation, is precisely that. It is perennially new. God did not create. God is creating. We ain't done yet. Isn't that good news? The new creation isn't just something new every year or every first Sunday or even every day. It's something that's new in every moment of every day. We serve the one who didn't just make all things once and for all, but who is making all things new. One who has all power and authority to strike us down any minute, but whose power and pleasure it is to remake us with each breath closer to the divine image which we bear, which is Christ-likeness. Join me in one prayerful breath as we invite the Spirit to remake us from the inside out this morning. Friends, let's pray that our lives, sown like seeds in the field, may come to more than our being covered in dirt. Let's pray that we, beloved children of God, rooted deeply in the love of Jesus Christ, may flourish fruitfully in the new creation of God's kingdom. Then let us pray that the Holy Spirit would move through us like a mighty gust of wind, that we in turn may sow even more seeds of grace. And let's pray that having lived into our calling as a royal priesthood of believers, we might provide a bountiful harvest for the one who planted us from the beginning. Then let's go and do likewise. Amen. Amen. Amen.